This is Derek O'Fodder and with The Medicine Shell, and today I'm going to discuss in Sibidi, the sacred and often secret language culture of what is now East Nigeria and Southwestern Cameroon. Studying in Sibidi was a journey. Every route I took led to a closed door, and every stone I turned led to more questions. Insibidi is a language of mystery, guarded by a secret society, but at the same time flourishing in our ancestral world. And from this example, you see the paradox in a lot of what I encountered and learned. Insibidi is the language of contradiction. In its prime, it united uncommon people, but at the same time distinguished the elites from the rest. It gets its name from a word meaning language of dread. But most of the preserved writing we have from the ancestral era tells of stories of love, friendship, relationships, intimate scandals, and humor. It is the language of a secret society of men, but was first used by women. It is a dead language, though today its spiritual elements are more alive than ever. And upon digging further, something clicked and it all came together. And from there, I learned the full power story and gained a deeper understanding of what Insibidi is. I also learned to write in the language. And from there, it has become a part of my spiritual development. In this video, I'll reveal what I learned about Insibidi that changed the way I view the script as well as written language as a whole, and how writing Insibidi became a part of my own spiritual practice and personal growth in my journey through Igbo cosmology. But first I'll share what Insibidi is, how it works, how it is used, and then finally reaching the spiritual revelation that unlocked its secrets for me. Long ago the people between the Cross and Calabar rivers learned that in order to keep themselves safe from the nighttime dangers of the forest, they would need to keep a fire lit. And therefore, when people would enter the forest at night, they would set up a fire. And around that fire, they remained safe to hunt, pray, and meditate through the night. For when the creatures of the forest saw the fire, they would run. From the trees above, something dropped before the people. And when the people saw what dropped before them, they ran, the same way the beast had run from their fire. These visitors were the Idioc. The Idioc were a baboon-like species that did not fear fire nor man, and in fact the presence of both brought them out of their hiding and into the camps and campfires of the visitors. So when people lit fires, the Idioc would emerge from the darkness, and the people would run back to the village, one after another, and after another, and another, until one village dared to hold still. This was the village of Uguakim. For the people of Uguakim were not afraid of apes, and upon staying still and observing them, the people of Uguakim noticed something was different about the Idioc. The Uguakim held their position and watched the Idioc, until after some time the Idioc began to write signs on the ground which the Uguakim did not understand. The Uguakim also noticed that every time an Idioc would make a sign in the sand, it would also make a matching sign through hand gestures and body movement. Soon, the Ugwa Kim learned through observation that the signs on the ground meant the same as the signs of the hand. And after many nights, the Idioc taught the Ugwa Kim the sign language, as well as the scripted language known as Insibiri. And from there, the people of Ugwa Kim emerged from the forest to teach the world of the new revelation. Insibidi is a communication tradition that spans a host of cultures in the region between Southeast Nigeria and Southwest Cameroon. Its oldest known artifacts, the Ikom monoliths near the community of Alok Ikom, date back 1,500 years ago, by most estimates. The monoliths themselves feature multiple Insibidi inscriptions, and till this day are of mysterious origin. Insibidi is a three-part communication culture that is made up of gestural Insibidi, or Insibidi sign language, spoken Insibidi, as well as ideographic written Insibidi, which is the form most of the world is familiar with today. I will explain Insibidi sign language and spoken Insibidi shortly, but to understand the core nature of the language, it's best to start with the written form. Insibidi is written in a code of ideographs. An ideograph is a symbol that represents thoughts or concepts as opposed to sounds as we have in the phonetic systems that we often use today. Because each unit in the language represents a whole idea rather than a sound, ideographic languages such as Insibidi are universal and do not need to be translated when switching from one language to another. This nature gives it two advantages. The first is that Insibidi is not read in a single structured format, neither up or down nor left or right, but instead images are observed as a collective whole and the narrative is decoded by putting all symbols in context with each other. This makes the language ideal for art, decoration, and the building of manifestation sigils, which I'll elaborate on shortly. Decoration at shrines or embellishment on cloth tell long form narratives with a great deal of flexibility in presentation and expression. The second major advantage is that symbols do not need to change based on the language of the speaker, and from this, an epic speaker can communicate their thoughts with an Igbo or Oran speaker without needing to translate. 
Because of this convenience, Insibidi grew as a language of its own, spreading from the Cross River region to southwest Cameroon and across the southeast of Nigeria, forming a connective fabric of communication across this diverse region, and even finding its way in the New World, which I'll also explain shortly. An ideogram is one level of abstraction removed from a pictogram, in the sense that each unit of an ideogram is tied to concepts rather than appearance. In a pictogram, images are literal or close to literal translations of what they mean. So the image of a bird comes to mean bird, and the image of a person comes to mean person. In ideographic writing, these concepts become loose abstractions of themselves, though often loosely based on the appearance of the concept, and at times easily recognizable. For example, this is the symbol for person. When bent to the right, it becomes man, and when bent to the left, it becomes woman. When the symbols intersect, they become love, union, family, and relationship. When the symbol of a third person is placed between them, they become division, conflict, breakup, or fight. When the symbol for talk is placed on the edge of each, it becomes a verbal argument. When the symbol of weapon is placed in the picture or on each side, it becomes violent conflict. And when the symbol for stranger, which is the symbol for person minus a leg, is placed in the picture, it becomes arbiter or dispute settler. And from there, this image says, A man and a woman, once happily in love, were divided when a spoiler came between them. Because of this, they exchanged words, and from there, the conflict became violent. It was then that judges from a neighboring community were called to settle the dispute. As you see from the example, the more symbols added to a picture, the more specific the message becomes, allowing for nuance and differentiation within the multiple symbols of a single idea. I can then add signs for tying, confinement, isolation, the number four, and once again the symbol for unity between the couple. With these symbols forming the core of my script, anything I add in any order will give context to the grander story. For further detail, I can add the symbol for promiscuous woman and the symbol for child. And now the story gives the narrative of a man and a woman once happily in love were divided when a promiscuous woman and the cheating husband had a child outside of marriage. Because of this, the couple exchanged words and soon the argument became violent on both ends. It was then that three judges from a neighboring community met with three judges from the host community to make a decision on the case. Finally, it was decided that the husband would spend four years in isolation before he was reunited with his wife and new child. This specific story is loosely based on an ancestral court document preserved by a visiting European in the village of Enyong and serves today as a great example of Nsibiri in its practical use. To understand how Insibidi was used, one of the more revealing clues lie in the subtext of what is preserved and still used from the ancestral era till today. By making a deeper examination of what has been preserved, as well as what is still in use as far as Insibidi goes, we can better understand how it was used in the ancestral era. Most of the known Insibidi of today relates to love, conflict, family, and friendship. And this is because the language is written in two forms, the first being a public practical form and second being a secret spiritual one. For most of society, Insibidi was not only accessible but in full use in the contemporary era, even going as far as being taught in schools until the breakout of the Biafra War. What these students learned was public Insibidi, which featured symbols that told narratives connected to interpersonal relationships, business, and formal addresses for practical use. Use of Insibidi was common enough in this era for over 500 known symbols of public Insibidi to be common sites in the region before the outbreak of the war. From them, we gain insight into relationship scandals, court decisions, humor, and gossip, as well as business transactions of our ancestors. Public insibidi was used by both men and women, and likely primarily women as it made its way into Uli, a symbolic art form for women primarily used in adorning homes, shrines, and famously in temporary tattoos that typically lasted eight days. It is also important to note that all forms of insibidi were first revealed by the idioc to women, and it was only later in history that men took control of its most powerful elements, forming a private wing of the language. To understand sacred in Sibiri, one must first understand its sacred guardian. The Ekbe Society is an esoteric brotherhood of initiated men that formed a secret society which controlled and united communities across the Ejagam, Efik, Ibo, Oron, Ibibio, and Anan cultures. The Ekbe Society determined priests, community heads, and judges in the societies they held sway. They established courts, police forces, trade guilds, and the most elite positioning within these institutions required individuals to be members of the order before they could be obtained. Among the many ways members distinguished themselves was in the wearing of ukara ekwe, a sacred cloth embellished with insibidi which can only be woven by the hands of a woman from the village region of Ezilo.
One of the closely guarded privileges of the Ikwe Lodge is the full knowledge of the sacred Nsibidi scripts, as well as Nsibidi sign language and the secret Nsibidi language spoken through the mouth. Secret Nsibidi featured symbols used for war, government, and most importantly, sigil magic, a form of will manifestation built around written patterns, symbols, and designs. The sigil magic of Nsibidi is used in meditation, prayer, will manifestation, and most importantly, divination. While little is known to the outside world about the spiritual form of Nsibidi, from observation one can see that it follows tighter structural rules, featuring a greater deal of symmetry and coordination of its sacred symbols. Much of what is written in the sacred form are revelations from sessions of divination, placed in places of prayer, shrines, and personal altars, in order to manifest messages from the hidden universe into reality. The Ikwe used the sacred form of the language to spread secret messages in plain sight between a vast network of governing lodges. Often, traveling members would document information of communities where passing Ikwe members could see it. These messages can be formal warnings and notifications, as well as instructions of action. It was also used in long-distance communication, with an element of deception. Often a message was given verbally to a messenger, and then Nsibidi was written on his body. The dual messages can then be one of two things. First, it can be a way of holding the messenger accountable, as what is written on the body must match what comes out of the mouth. Secondly, it was a way of sending secret messages, as a decoy message would come out verbally while the true message was written on the body in plain sight. In times of war, these messages coordinated the multilingual military alliances of the Arochuku Confederacy into a single attack force, able to successfully coordinate battle through writing, signing, and speaking the hidden portions of the Incibiti language. Ekbe is also a masquerade society, which controls and presents masquerades such as Ekbo, Ekbe, Akata, and Ekong. These masquerades serve as entertainment as well as policing units and communities. They're also an effective means of displaying the esoteric prowess of the leopard society. One of the ways of doing this is by using the masquerades to present signed and verbal incibiti. During the ceremonies, masquerade controllers coordinated the phases of the drama the masquerades would perform using signed incibiti. This is also an opportunity to spread messages among Epe members in the audience. The masquerades themselves would then speak and be spoken to in verbal incibiti. Little is known about signed and verbal Nsibidi outside of the society, but what little that has been revealed gives insight into the nature of the language. Verbal Nsibidi includes words such as Ibang, Ikbasi, Ekbaku, and Ofobi, and most interestingly, Abokwa, which I'll explain shortly. While Ikbasi is said to mean coconut and Ibang may mean anchor, used as Nsibidi they become code with their true meaning held secret by the Ekbe, and it has remained so for thousands of years in the region as well as the island of Cuba. The Ikwe society spread to the island of Cuba, where it became the Abuqua. Through the transatlantic slave trade, the rights, knowledge, and structure of the Ikwe society resurfaced in the Cuban town of Regla. Through the Abuqua, traditions of the Ikwe live on, though often taking on local influences, but fundamentally remaining connected to the Ikwe despite over a hundred years of separation. The Abuqua, through their underground structure and hidden knowledge, served as a rally point for the Cuban underground and are today synonymous with rebellion and resistance to oppressive regimes, colonialism, and slavery. Most importantly, the Abuqua have preserved the Incibidi language in the form of La Firma, and like their brothers in Southeast Nigeria, the script remains a guarded secret for only initiated members, still serving as a means of spiritual connection, meditation, transcendence, and manifestation through the rites of divination. Learning this and many other things allowed me to see something special behind the act of writing and grow in my own understanding of magic and manifestation as a whole. And connecting the story of Nsibidi, the Abuqua, the Ekbe, and the art of women in Southeast Nigeria with the many stories of writing and the origins of script throughout the world allowed for something to click. When considering the origin stories of many writing forms throughout history, it's clear to me that the story of the Idiok is an allegory. Throughout the world, the spirits connected to writing or the spirits who have said to have brought writing to the world, are consistently connected to the act of divination and the idea of magic. Most importantly, the idea of the anima, the inner universal mind, or what we call agon in our culture, the arushi of divination and inner wisdom, the arushi that knows what God knows. The Greeks cite Hermes, the personification of the inner mind, and the god of magic as the bringer of writing. The Egyptians cite thought, their personification of the inner mind, and the anima, and the wisest spirit of all. The earliest Chinese scripts were written as divination notes on turtle shells and bones, both connected to the inner mind, the act of divination, and the anima. And as you survey the world, the pattern recurs. There's another form of writing that emerged in southeast Nigeria, known as the Aneke script. 
In the 1950s, a man by the name of Wangu Aneke wrote a hundred textbooks worth of esoteric works and anti-colonial scripts before passing away in 1991. But Aneke's writing was different. Aneke was a successful Dibya and a master of divination who, by his own accord, was chosen by Agu, the Arishi of divination and the internal mind, to enter the forest of his native Umuleri and reveal the world's secrets through script. When Agu first chose him, the community feared that he had lost his mind, for in order to do this, the spirit instructed him to look on the back of leaves and derive the symbols for the new form of writing based on the patterns he would see. After his mission in the forest of Umuleri was complete, Haneke emerged and dedicated his life to revealing what the gods had revealed to him through his new script. And through learning the Haneke script, one can unlock the esoteric knowledge of the great diviner, as well as his commentaries on neo-colonialism and the liberation of the African continent. So to me, the story of the Idioch, the story of Joseph Haneke, and various stories related to the emergence of writing tell of a similar pattern. The forest of the Idioch is the inner mind. It is vast, it is dark, and it is unknown. It is scary to think about entering. But once you find a way to enter, be it meditation, prayer, thought, or revelation, the things you feared within it will scatter. Then, like the Ugu Akim, you will see truth, and it'll scare you. But like the Ugu Akim, by holding still in the vast wilderness, the truth will teach you something. The truth will give you its magic, and you will leave the forest with something that can change your life or the world around you. And this story recurs again and again throughout history. So when I hear stories with similar patterns and different characters, I know that I'm witnessing an allegory for something that is universal and something that is human. So from this, I learned to reconsider how I see writing, as those who brought it to us did not see writing the way we see it today. Beyond a method of documentation and art, I've incorporated in Sibidi and my own spiritual manifestation and meditation practices. I began learning how to use the script to access my inner mind, and manifest my will, as well as seeing the magic in the writing sigils and scripts of others. Because through learning about Insibiti, I have a fuller understanding of what writing has always been. And that's it. Uh, this topic was a lot of fun for me to cover, and I appreciate you guys for watching, as always. I cover Igbo spirituality and culture, if you're new to the channel. And if you want to see more video essays like this, make sure to subscribe. I've also opened a Patreon. I'm interested in doing these videos full time so that I can produce more and put them out faster. I also want to start doing full documentaries, animations, and instructionals. And donating to the Patreon would go a long way in helping that happen. If you can't donate, that is all right. Um, sharing this video on social media, uh, be it Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook, or just subscribing helps as well. As always, thank you for watching and let me know what topic you want me to cover next. Take care.